Sales Magazine and Pipeline of CRM. And today, I'm delighted to welcome back Bill Treasurer. Hey, Bill. Hey, John. Good to see you again. Who is in Asheville, North Carolina. And I'm extremely delighted to welcome his co-author of the Leadership Killer book, uh, John Havlick, who is in Tampa. How are you doing, John? Hey, John. How's it going there? And if you notice there over John's uh, shoulder, you will see the Navy SEAL emblem because John has, uh, has spent 29 years in the Navy SEALs. Uh, he just uh, retired in 2014. So this, uh, this book is, is an incredible combination of Bill's experience in, in corporate, uh, in corporate America and John's experience in the Navy SEALs and bringing them together, bringing those experiences together to uh, write a book about leadership. And the, and the subtitle is Recla Reclaiming Humility in an Age of Arrogance. So, um, John, maybe I'll start with you. Can you tell me the genesis of this book and your collaboration with John and, and why you thought combining the military and the civilian together would, would bring such a powerful book? Um, Bill and I reconnected. We both were athletes at West Virginia University. He was a diver. I was a swimmer. Uh, I was coaching the year. He was a freshman. We did our separate ways, uh, reconnected about 30, after about 30 years, a few years back at a reunion. And, uh, you know, I just retired and he was doing his consulting firm down there in Nashville. So I, I talked to him about what he did, his leadership, courageous leadership seminars and, and, uh, I offered to speak, and so he's brought me on several times to speak in support of those. And and all the time when you talk different leadership topics, and it just seemed like every week or almost every day we read something or see an article about a good leader going bad, doing something stupid. And uh, we would share that with each other. And uh, the uh, Bill, after a couple of months of it, Bill came up with the idea. He's like, "Hey, look, I'm thinking about writing a fifth book." Would you like to co-author it? And I was, I was honored that he'd asked me and said yes right away. And so that's that's the genesis of the book, and and thought it'd be really good to bring the like you said the military and the civilian side share our experiences. Yeah, and maybe that's your next book. There, good leaders gone bad. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> plenty of examples of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, and so and so, Bill. What attracted you to bringing the uh, bringing John and bringing the military aspect into it? For because obviously you've been doing this in corporate America for a long time. What did you think that corporate America can learn from from uh, a military expert and particularly like a, a decorated Navy SEAL like John? Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 hey, this is sales pop. So let me be honest about it. I mean, there is a marketing factor to it. I, I figured that. You know, by including a Navy SEAL, and John has served on all the SEAL teams, you know, all the, all the cool ones, he's been part of it, you know. I figured that uh, it would add some marketing ability to the book for, you know, just sheer practicality. But the other, the fact is that John's got credible, real-life leadership experience. It, you know, corporate experience is very valid, and it, it, uh, there's a lot of leadership uh, is directed at corporate audiences. That said, in the military, it's pretty consequential, right? Like people die based yeah. on do you have a good or bad leader, which is much more consequential than the corporate world, which involves money. So mm -hmm. I thought that involving both those perspectives, and both of us have worked with, in John's case, has led a lot of teams. In my case, have worked with a lot of leaders. John, too, has worked with a lot of leaders of all military ranks. So I thought that between the two of them, a, you'd get some really good, solid leadership experience and insight and perspective. But B, it would have the wow factor of having a cool Navy SEAL uh, on, the, on the book. And it, it would overcome my dumpiness by having <laughs> big, masculine, handsome SEAL attached to the book. It would only be a good thing. Yin and yang. Yeah, there you go. So, um, so John, let me ask you because the subtitle is "Reclaiming Humility in an Age of Arrogance," right? And, and I'm assuming that when you're in in something like the the Navy SEALs um, leadership, you you can't be arrogant, can you? Really, in in the situations that uh, that you guys um, put yourselves in. So, can you tell me about um, just the idea of? arrogance and leadership and and the, and how that can impact uh, a group an organization a team 
Well, I think, uh, you know, I would counter your statement by saying that to lead a bunch of super type A personalities, you have to be a little arrogant. Uh, so there, you have to find the fine line of being right. calm and arrogant. And because the guys can pick it out, mm -hmm. so you have to have the confidence in you that you can make a decision. But you also, as a leader, have to be strong enough to control the masses and get them to do what you need them to do. And so, and I found that in, in swimming also is you, there's a, there's a fine line of being cocky and arrogant and uh, each leader has to find what really drives them and, and do that. And so, you know, I tried to do the best I could using my swimming talents to go into the teams and, and lead SEALs and, and other special operations personnel uh, to, to do what you have to do. And yeah, cause it's uh it can be a little crazy out there. So <laughs> I'm sure. I, I think too, John, that, that a, a leader, a, a followers can sniff it out. Look, look, they want confidence and they want somebody who's comfortable in their own skin, has a solid sense of direction, can be decisive, but ultimately is focused on the mission and getting things done and being right by their people. If they start to, to smell that you're really all about you and that you're showcasing yourself and you're talking about yourself all the time, those follow followers are going to lose confidence in that leader very quickly. Yeah, and let's face it, arrogance can often be uh, a cover for lack of confidence anyway, right? So, oh, yeah. I mean, I guess in, in what you're saying there, Bill and John is like uh, sniffing it out that if somebody is is you know too arrogant, that it often is it's just covering up from their for their own insecurities, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it bluster, it's bluster, right? That you you remember the Wizard of Oz with the big giant green head? Who goes there, right? But then you pull back the curtain, and it's just this little wimpy guy. And I think a lot of people sort of overcome their own inadequacy inadequacies by a projection of being stronger than they actually are. Yeah, like like I said, you know, leading leading the guys, they could sniff you out if you were good or bad, you know. And it, it wasn't it didn't take a whole lot either, so. They're sharp guys and they want people that make a decision and think about them as an individual, but they're going to do the right thing, what's right for the mission. And, and, that, and they can sniff that out very quickly. So, yeah, um, I was going to ask you, so what makes, uh, in, in terms of a SEAL team, like what, what makes, uh, what are the qualities you look for in a good leader of a SEAL team? Uh, I'm often said the best leaders are the guys who can make a decision and, and you try to make the right one. And if it's not, uh, the right one, then you learn quickly and hopefully you don't make it again. But to me, the good leaders are the ones that can make a decision that think about the troops, take a, their, uh, their opinion in because they're super smart, often smarter than you are. And you're foolish if you don't ask them for their advice, because I've found that if you bring people in part of the planning process, uh, you're all towards one common goal, success, the mission, and it works a lot better. Yeah, so that's interesting. So, so Bill, in the in the corporate world, right? I mean, I I've often seen that myself is that um, leaders who are paralyzed and can't make decisions, or who kind of equivocate or try and sort of make half a decision, and it, it can lead to chaos in an organization. But decision making, you know, being decision making and involving people in that process is something that doesn't always come natural to a lot of people who are in leadership positions. No, it's, it's true. It, um, I, in one of my books, I, I talk about two different kinds of leaders, pig heads, and, and those pig heads are the ones that are all about themselves. It's my way or the highway. They're, you, know, you can't get through to them because it's all about them. They're pig headed. But the second type of leader is more common and just as bad, and we call those weaklings. Mm -hmm. And weaklings are wishy-washy, they flip-flop, they'll tell you a decision, but then they go and hear some other input, and then they change the decision. And weaklings, I think, are more common and just as dangerous as having a, a pig-headed weakling. One of the things that I think is important when it comes to, you mentioned, you know, you, know, you asked John about what does it take to be a good leader of a, of a SEAL team. I think it takes to be a good leader of any team is the idea of having a good sense of core values and principles. Who are you? And what do you stand for? And what are lines that you won't cross? It's funny, John will come in and speak to uh, our corporate groups. And, and even with me, it, 
when I get too close to something that John has done and I'll ask him a question about a mission that he had or a secret, I'm trying to find out a seal secret. John will tell you about the seals, but there are lines that he won't cross. They're old school. Now there's some seals that will, but John is old school. And when you butt up against those lines, his clue is he'll say, hmm, how's the weather in Tampa? And that's his clue to, that's his clue to the audience. That's his clue to me. It's like, don't push any further. Don't go in it, you know. So having a core uh, uh, of principles that you won't violate as a leader is, uh, it's about integrity at the end of the day. And, and I think that that's what differentiates a good leader, you know, or a great leader, I would say, from an average leader. Is how well do you uphold your principles? How much integrity do you yeah. really have? And part of that making the decision to me, both military or business, what I've seen is, you know, if you make the decision, stay consistent in the way you do it. You know, and don't waffle because, again, in the teams, the guys hate wafflers. They want a guy who makes a decision, but they don't respect somebody who can't make a decision or changes all the time, and, you, and you're not consistent. So, yeah, no, I, I think that's I think that's fascinating, and I think also the point that uh, you just made there, Bill, about uh, about integrity and lines that they uh, won't cross. I think today is um, one of the things that I noticed today because we live in this really bizarre culture today, you know, this superficial, um, everybody's building their brands, and everybody's posting stuff all the time or whatever, that it's, it's hard sometimes to tell what are people's core principles and what are their lines. I mean, obviously, John, as, as you said there, I mean, in, in a situation with a, an ABCL team, I mean, you, you really need to trust that leader, right? You really need to know um, uh, what his core, princ his core principles are and what he would do in the, these circumstances. You need, really need trust there, right? But you need to know it. Uh, yeah, because your life's on the line. When you're in that charge, you're, you've got a lot of other people looking out. That hopefully, you're going to look out for their best interests. So. Failure, failure in the teams is life-threatening. So, um, yes, you have to believe in the, you know, and that's what we learned from day one at Buds, you know, especially as an officer is you have the best interests of your men. And, and, you know, when you make a decision, you have to be good at it and you have to care about them and, and do what's right for the mission and for them. So. And, and Bill, to, to that point, I mean, this is what I see a lot now is, that, as I said, is it's hard to tell what people's core principles are because it's getting covered in so much noise or whatever. I think that um, people don't spend enough time and leaders don't spend enough time actually uh, letting people know what their core principles are and where their, where their lines are. Yeah, I don't think that a lot of people know them. You know, we're so, you talk about the sort of social media world, and by the way, I get caught up in it. Yeah, right? no, we all do. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, uh, and I think that we don't, I think that not enough leaders spend enough time thinking. I saw a interesting clip with Bill Gates talking to uh, with Warren Buffett, and it just happened to be on the Charlie Rose show. But but the, the, he had, Charlie Rose asked Bill Gates, "What is it that you've learned about spending time with Warren Buffett?" And he said, "Well, if you look at Warren Buffett's schedule right now, like pick that up right now because his schedule is right there." He says, "You're going to find a lot of white space." And sure enough, Charlie opens it and says, yeah, Wednesday, there's only two things on it and there's a lot of space. And the whole point was Bill Gates thought that your value is how productive you are. How much can you fill your yeah. time with as much stuff and interruption as possible? Where Warren Buffett was the opposite. He wanted to have a lot of white space because he needed good thinking time. And that helped Bill Gates. And I think a lot of people don't allow that. We're so caught up in the distracted world that we don't get a lot of good time to reflect anymore. I once saw an interview with James Taylor, and he said what he missed about growing up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, is he used to be able to take long walks and have long thoughts right. and bring them to the conclusion, right? We're sort of in the distracted age, and I think a leader who can, be, who can think at depth, who can shut out the noise of the world, is going to be able to tap into an inner wisdom that not enough, are, uh, uh, not enough of us are tapping yeah. into. Anymore. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more because uh, one of my one of my uh, pet uh, subjects nowadays is like people will tell you, oh, 
I'm so busy. I'm much busier than I've ever been. I'm overwhelmed and whatever. And I say, and I often say, are you really, or are you just more distracted than you've ever been? Because right. um, sure, you've got your, you've got your phone buzzing, you've got this coming up, you've got all this stuff going on. And so it's, for me, it's not really that you're, that you're that much busier. It's that you're that much more just uh, distracted. And I, and I like what you say about the fact of giving yourself time to think and reflect and, and I guess, John, in your case, like if you're planning for a mission or something like that, you really need to spend time thinking it through to the to um, to the finest details. Right. Because you can't go. You couldn't go into a mission a distractive or, or half prepared, could you? No, I mean, that's that's an open invitation for failure. But, you know, there's different scenarios where you have a long planning period or a hey, you got to go do it. Sure. You know? And uh, you just attack one each separately. But best case scenario is you do some in-depth planning. You, uh, we call it, you what if it to death, you know? Hey, what, if, what if this happens, you know? Because something you always learn is that Guy Murphy is waiting outside the gate as soon as you walk outside. And so mm -hmm. the radios stop working and you're all the other, but, you know, and you plan and plan and what if it, and hopefully you try to hit every worst case scenario so that, you at least thought about it, and then if something comes up that you didn't think about, you 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 got some options that allow you to react and get out of there and do the right thing. So absolutely, yeah. I always love the fact that uh, you know the Irish are synonymous with screwing, yeah, you know, with exactly. screwing everybody up. You know, Murphy. Yeah, Murphy. <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah, and there's plenty of them, plenty of them around. But uh, so. Um, <laughs> So, so, uh, so, Bill, what do you see today is one of the most core lessons that business leaders can learn from people like John? Well, I, uh, I think, you know, this idea, again, of having a core, mm -hmm. uh, knowing what you stand for, identifying your core values, and then living by them. Um, and then, you know, in the book, where, where John and I sort of conclude the book is that you as a leader – you need to decide to do to uh, what you're going to do with your power. It's a, it's a really critical question. What am I going to do with this leadership power that I have? And it really comes down to a critical choice. Do you want to lead or do you want to rule? You want to be a leader or do you want to be a ruler? And there's a big difference. And we hope that after the reader reads the book, they'll recognize that yes, confidence matters, but so does humility. And a leader has both. A ruler only really has the arrogant piece. But the, the leader really has confidence and humility. So, so that's what I think that is the central lesson of the book. What are you going to do with your power? And do you want to be a leader or a ruler? Yeah, that's a great point. And, and John, can I ask you, um, when you led your first uh, team and your first missions or whatever, what, what, what surprised you? What, what, what surprised you when you first did it that maybe you weren't expecting or even um, surprised you about yourself? What would, can, can, you, uh, can you give me some insight into that? Uh, well, the weather is kind of nice here in Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think the best thing that I ever learned on anything was just... Um, how a small group of dedicated guys can really come together and, and kick ass basically, you know, and, and do the impossible. And, uh, and it's just comes from good people, good planning and good execution. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I actually think that's a critical piece and I, and, and it's something I can 150 million percent agree with. And I think sometimes, organizations we throw people at problems right you know and we always think bigger is better more people you have the more resources when really at the end of the day if you have the right people led in the right way with the right skill set small teams can achieve way more i always say a small team of good people will always outperform a huge team of mediocre people right it's <laughs> a good way of putting it absolutely mm -hmm. you know our our motto for my buds class was uh General Westmoreland once said if he had 10,000 SEALs, he could have won the war in uh, Vietnam, you know. Mm. So, or, or probably any other war for that. Probably <laughs> kills on the back, but yes. our, our book movie. is about hubris, John. Just <laughs> to remind you. <laughs> there you go. Here's a clear. Prime example. <laughs> 
So, I've been, um, sorry, go ahead. No, I've been watching too many SEAL shows, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, so, so Bill, is there anything else from the book that you particularly want to highlight and particularly with John on the line here as well? I, I feel like we've covered the major points. Maybe, maybe the only thing else that I would add is that, you know, you look, any leader, any person has tendencies that move towards selfishness. Mm -hmm. And we have to resist that, that, you know, you got to lead yourself first and it takes self-discipline, say it takes self-governance, but to acquire humility is, it's not that hard. You can do little things like talk about yourself less, like use the word I less and the words me and or use the word we more. Um, ask questions instead of telling people stuff all the time. Have a check, somebody that can call you on your BS. John's really good at doing that for me. So there are simple things a person can do to acquire humility, and it's really essential that that a person does. Mm -hmm. And and I think John, the 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 big takeaway I think um, from your side is is exactly what you said, and I think this is a great lesson too for leaders. Is when you're in a you know when you're in a team like a SEAL team, right? Everybody has particular skill sets um, and there are things so, so you I presume at times you call upon different people for different input and different advice and that but you have to have as you say as a leader you have to have the humility to ask the person who knows better even if you're the leader right yeah I, I love the perfect point I remember in training when I was planning my first you know training operation and I was doing it all you know and I, I was losing it you know and after, <laughs> You know, one of my instructors came up and he, he goes, what are you doing this all for? You got, you know, look at your guys over there, you know, rely on them to help. And, and you have to come down, you have to rely on those guys and trust them that, you know, you all have, you know, the mission in mind and that you're all towards a common goal. And you have, you have to break down and ask for help, absolutely. You can't do it all. And if you do that well and, and people trust you, they'll ultimately look to you, though, to make the final decision, right? Well, you have to. I mean, you know, you know the guys, somebody told me, you know, the officers get, uh, you know, the enlisted get yelled at, the officers get relieved. You know? <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah you are you ultimately on the hook for accountability. Absolutely. You know, and it's a good, good reminder. I mean, it's why we called the book The Leadership Killer. Mm -hmm. That if, if you're going to put your arrogance to work, eventually, A, it's going to do wrong by the mission and wrong by your team. It'll kill morale. It'll kill loyalty. But ultimately, it'll kill your career and your legacy of what you could have been as a leader. So it's a killer. You got you to deal with this arrogance stuff because it, it's deadly to leadership. Yeah. I, no. I couldn't agree more. I mean, obviously, for other people, I don't have to do that. But um, <clears throat> that was a weak attempt at a joke, but <laughs> yeah. never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Only one of us can kill you, and it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully, John's in Tampa today, although he does have a place, as you said, down in San Diego. So I'm going to stay friendly with John. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thanks. Uh, thanks, both of you. Uh, thanks, uh, Captain John Havlick. Uh, former Navy SEAL, and thank you, obviously, for all your service to, to the great country of America. And um, I'd love to ask you a load of questions, but I don't want to keep hearing about the weather in Tampa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, John, for having me on today. Appreciate it. And um, Bill, great to talk to you again. And I really, I really encourage people to, to read the book. I mean, I think this is a fascinating combination uh, of, of two different perspectives uh, coming together for one central message. Fantastic. Thanks again, John, for having us on. Yeah, thank you. Again, my name is John Golden, SS Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert insight interview really soon. Thank you.